Hello everyone and welcome to this video in the OCR A-Level PE Anatomy and Physiology series. So today what we're going to be looking at is the respiratory system during exercise. So by the end of today's video guys you should be able to do these three things. So firstly explain the physiology of how the mechanics of breathing has now changed during exercise as opposed to during a rest. You should be able to explain the physiology of how the regulation of breathing has now changed during exercise and recovery. And finally you should be able to draw and annotate key respiratory graphs. So if we look here, guys, we're just going to look at the mechanics of breathing during exercise and how it's changed from during rest. So inspiration, again, it's active. It's still using ATP for those muscular contractions. So what you need to know is basically the diaphragm contracts and flattens and the external intercostals contract more than at rest. The additional muscles, which are the sternocleidomastoid and the pectoralis minor, also contract. The rib cage then moves up and out more than at rest. And what this means, this means that volume of the lungs increases and pressure in the lungs decreases more than at rest. So more air can now enter the lungs than it could at rest. Uh, expiration, on the other hand, is now active. It was passive, remember, during rest, but now it has to use ATP for those additional muscles to contract. So if we look at the process, so the diaphragm relaxes and domes and the external intercostals relax more than at rest. However, now the internal intercostals and the rectus abdominis contract. What this means for expiration is the ribcage moves down and in more than at rest. So therefore, volume of the lungs decreases and pressure inside the lungs increases more than at rest. So more air leaves the lungs than at rest. So it's fairly simple, guys. You need to learn the process of how this works. So once you've got those notes down, guys, what I want you to do is pause the video here and just write down these key terms pretty quick because they are crucial for underpinning the knowledge of the later parts of the video. So once you've got them down, guys, what we're going to look at now is the regulation of breathing during exercise and recovery. So there's three main parts to what you know the process. So the first part is the inspiratory centre increases stimulation of both the phrenic and intercostal nerves. So the diaphragm and external intercostals contract with more force. It also stimulates those additional muscles that we talked about before, which are, again, the sternocleidomastoid and the pectoralis minor to also contract. This then increases volume and decreases pressure in the lungs more than it does at rest. So more air rushes into the lungs and breathing depth also increases. The second part of this is what we call the Herring-Brewer reflex, which is also noted at the bottom there. So specialised baroreceptors in the lungs monitor lung stretch. Once the stretch threshold has been reached, those specialised baroreceptors send that information to the EC, which is situated in the brain. And once again, guys, that is called the Herring-Brewer reflex. So moving forward to the last part of breathing regulation is going to be where the EC receives that information from the baroreceptors and stimulates those additional muscles to contract, which are the internal intercostals and the rectus abdominis. This then decreases volume and increases pressure more at rest, so more air moves out the lungs at rest. So once again, guys, I'd like you to pause the video here and just quickly get down these key terms before I go into what this oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve is. So basically, guys, this oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve, as it says down here, is it shows us the relationship between the partial pressure of oxygen and the percentage saturation of hemoglobin. So if we look down here at this big L, that's the lungs. So we at the lungs, you are at 100 partial pressure of oxygen milligrams per mercury. And it means that you are 100% saturated with hemoglobin because it's a high partial pressure of oxygen. But if we move down to the muscles, we're about 50% saturation because you know, it's dissociated down the concentration gradient into the cells of the body. So that's basically what that shows. Moving forward, guys, we need to understand the effect of exercise on gaseous exchange. So there's four things you really need to know here. And basically, these are only going to be like one, two, three markers in the exam. So it's just about learning the facts and be able to just quickly get them down in the exam. So firstly, we'll look at oxygen and the effect oxygen has on gaseous exchange. So basically, air, when you're aerobically respiring to produce ATP, you're using oxygen, so the partial pressure of oxygen in those muscles then decreases. That means that there's now a steeper concentration gradient between the blood, which is oxygenated, and those muscles. <clears throat> Therefore, more oxygen can dissociate from the haemoglobin and diffuse into the muscles. So, if we look on the other hand at carbon dioxide, so during aerobic respiration, you're actually producing carbon dioxide as a byproduct. This means there's a steeper concentration gradient between the muscles and the blood of that carbon dioxide. So more carbon dioxide can diffuse into the blood from the muscles. So the next one we need to look at is temperature. So basically, fairly simple. As temperature increases, it enables 
oxygen to dissociate more easily from the hemoglobin. You don't need to know, but basically it just changes the chemical structure of that protein, which is the hemoglobin, so it can unload more easily. So the final one you need to know about is acidity. So both lactic acid and carbonic acid enable oxygen to dissociate from, you know, hemoglobin more easily. And what this is called, this is called the Bohr shift, which we'll go into next. So basically, guys, this shows the Bohr shift. It shifts down to the right from A to B. So if we look at P50, this is the muscle. So before, you know, the buildup of acid, 50% would unload from the hemoglobin into the muscles. But now that the acid has changed the chemical structure of that protein, you can have 65% unloading and only 35% of the oxygen remains associated with the hemoglobin. So that's basically what that is. So the next thing we need to know, guys, is how to draw and annotate these key graphs. So I know my drawing is horrendous, but bear with me. I think that's clear and easy to see. So this first graph up here, it shows breathing frequency related to time. So as breathing frequency increase, well, sorry, Breathing frequency increases linearly with exercise intensity as the demand for oxygen from the working muscles is increasing. It will then plateau during maximal intensity exercise as there is a minimum time required for inspiration to occur. Therefore, it can't keep increasing as so it plateaus. So the next graph you need to see is beneath this is tidal volume. Tidal volume is up the y-axis and time across the x-axis. So once again, tidal volume increases linearly with exercise intensity as the demand of oxygen from the working muscles is increasing. However, tidal volume will plateau during submaximal intensity exercise because basically breathing frequency is increasing more and more and more. So there's not enough time to inspire more air. So it will then have to plateau as it can't get more air per breath. So the final graph you need to know, guys, is this one about minute ventilation. So minute ventilation increases linearly with exercise intensity because both frequency and tidal volume are also increasing. Minute ventilation will also plateau towards maximal intensity exercise because both breathing frequency and tidal volume also plateau. Now, why? It's because, as we know, minute ventilation equals tidal volume times breathing frequency. So, final slide before we recap what we've done today, guys, is basically you just need to get down these two tables and learn the values. And then, once again, guys, make those Brainscape flashcards. So, for example, one of the flashcards you can make is state the tidal volume for an untrained athlete's during maximal intensity exercise and you'll be like hmm two and a half liters and they'll be like yes cool that's correct another example is you could say state the breathing frequency for a trained athlete during rest and you can be like boom 10 breaths per minute it's just about learning these facts because there only be one mark you know multiple choice for example in an exam so if we go over what we've learned today guys basically we can now explain the physiology of how the mechanics of breathing has changed during exercise we can now explain how the regulation of breathing has changed during exercise recovery. And we can now draw and annotate key respiratory graphs. So moving into the next video, we are going to look at the first part of ATP resynthesis. So basically, we need to understand what ATP is and how it is used as an energy source. We then need to understand the process of ATP PP system and the process of anaerobic glycolysis, which are two of the three energy systems. And finally, we'll look at the pros and cons of both of these energy systems. So thank you very much for watching, guys. Please subscribe if you haven't already and share this channel with your friends who are also studying AWP. And I will see you in the next video. Thank you.